after you asking me what do you demand and the one thing god doesn't need god doesn't want that's what they offer there are some people that bring animals to god and they say they bring a goat they bring a sheep they bring a cow and what's the sanitary question for that other people bring this and that he says go find out the one thing god requires the same thing as you come over here you are born again you are a child of god shouldn't you find out what has got one of me What's he demanding from me? What's the one single thing that he says, this is what I want? Look at that verse 12 again. It says, in verse 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. He said, that's all he wants. That you come to the Lord, have faith in Him. When it says fear Him, it means consider Him. It means whatever He doesn't want, get that out of your life. Appreciate Him, honor Him, exalt Him, and have faith in Him. And believe that the right thing is what He demanded. And what He demanded is what I'm going to give. He says, what has the Lord demanded of you? Just love Him and just give yourself over to Him and trust Him. Have faith and love. We're talking about this in the Deuteronomy chapter 11. Chapter 11 verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently. In chapter 11 verse 13. Unto my commandments which I command you this day to love the Lord your God. To love the Lord your God. It says that's all. That's all. To love the Lord your God. And to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That I will give you rain in your land in due season. He said blessings will keep on flowing. As long as this one thing I want, this one thing I require, don't think about yourself. Think about your God. Don't think about the people. Think about your God. Don't think about what will satisfy you, make you happy. And you know, sometimes the things that make us happy, they don't make God happy. There are many people in the world, some people, it's alcohol that makes them happy. Beer that makes them happy. Drinking that makes them happy. That doesn't make God happy. Other people, it is wickedness and being truants, tyrants, wicked, being violent. When there's a fight somewhere in the street and then they remove their jacket and then they put on the nika and then they have a dagger in their hand and they're shouting and screaming. That's what makes them happy. That also make God happy. Sodomites. What made the Sodomites happy? When you know the men and the men, they come together and they are making fools of themselves and committing morality. That's what makes them happy. That doesn't make God happy. Think about it. It is not what you, makes you happy. That's important. It is what makes God happy. And what's that? Just one thing. Love Him with all your heart, all your soul, all your, all your mind. Some people, when they go to the nightclub, and then they dim the light, and then they do what they call dancing, whatever, it makes them happy. It doesn't make God happy. He who swear, whosoever will be a friend of the world will be an enemy of God. Find out the one thing that makes God happy. Bring your heart, your life, and lay it at the feet of the Lord. I give my heart to you. Jesus died for me. And because Jesus died for me, I give myself unto him unreservedly. And the Lord says, when you do that and you love this God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, that makes him happy. And his word, it will be fulfilled in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm looking at verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God, thank God, is your God. If you are born again, you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have turned away from your sin. You believe on the Lord. Now he has cleansed you and washed you and saved you and forgiven you. And as genuine conversion, that means that it is the Lord your God. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. He said, well, I, I, I want you to love me with all your heart, but there's an impediment. There's something that is covering that love. There's something that is decreasing that there's something that is hindering that love from flowing out freely. And it is the nature you're brought into this world. You are born with it. 
And because of that carnal nature, that simple nature, that Adamic nature, because of that evil, natural propensity, you'll not be able to love me the way I want. And therefore, I'm going to perform an operation on you. And this operation, only God can perform it. Moses could not perform that operation for them. Aaron could not perform that operation for them. And none of those priests or Levites could perform the operation for them. They could tell them about the operation. They could preach to them about the operation. And they could encourage them about that operation. But in the final analysis, it is only God that could perform that operation of circumcision. Circumcision of the heart. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. The Lord is saying the purpose of that oppression of the heart, the purpose of that cleansing, circumcision of the heart is so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. The place and the priority of love and faith that what he requires from you. That in your heart, without any inhibition, and without any hindrance, and without any limitation, without any reservation, that you love him completely, entirely, wholeheartedly, that's the will of the Lord, and that's why it's going to perform the oppression in your heart. Matthew chapter 22, the New Testament tells us the same thing, that this is still what is important. You know what, brothers and sisters? The old law passed away, but love towards God will never pass away. The law of circumcision of the flesh and the law of this, of this kind of uh, the celebration or ceremonies that they perform, offering animals and offering this and offering that and building an altar and uh, pouring this and pouring that, pouring oil, all that passed away. The law of Moses passed away. The love for the children of Israel passed away. But there's one thing that will never pass away. That is love. If love will pass away, what will happen between father, mother, and children? If love will pass away. If love will pass away, what will happen between husband and wife? If love will pass away, what will happen between man and the people in the world? Our neighbors. If love will pass away, what will happen to Calvary? No. Love remains. And if they say anything, when they tell you that one has passed away, that one has passed away, that one has passed away, don't worry about that. Something that will never pass away is the love. Love of God towards His people. And the love of His people towards Him. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Even when we get to heaven, they will see the love in heaven. If you get to heaven and there's no love there, what will heaven look like? Love will never pass away. Because you know, God is love. And to say that love has passed away means that you are saying God is passing away. God forbid. I said God forbid. Love will always be there. And the Lord is saying, the only way you can know that you are still in me, you know, it's not about the law of Moses, about the law of, uh, you know, this, about the covenant of that. It is about the love you have for me. The place and the priority, the preeminence of loving God with all your heart. Matthew chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. But part of your heart? I said, is it part of your heart? Not partially, wholeheartedly. With all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That means, as you look at everything in your heart, everything you have in your heart, uh, that's a seed of understanding. And a seed of all the ability you have. And a seed of all your intelligence. With all your intelligence, with all your will, with all your mind, with all your resources, with all your capacities, all your ability, your love, the Lord, and with all your strength and all your mind. When you are serving the Lord, you will say, I'm going to give this to God. I'm reserving my energy for another thing. That's not loving God with all your mind. And when, when you come to the Lord, I'm going to use my intelligence to plan strategy in my place of work. When we come to the church and they are planning strategy on this and that, I must be reserved now because if I give all my wisdom, 
If I give all my understanding, if I give all my knowledge, if I give all my intelligence, if I give all my strength, when I get to my place of work, what strategy am I going to use again? You are not loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your intellect, all your intelligence, all your wisdom, everything you've got, you bring to the Lord. You say, everything I've got, I'm going to love the Lord. I'm going to keep the commandments of the Lord and just expand the kingdom of God with everything I've got. And that's the priority of love, the preeminence of love towards the Lord Almighty. He's done it for us, so we're going to do it for Him too. In First John chapter four verse nineteen, First John chapter four verse nineteen, we love Him because He first loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. And there's nothing you can give that will be greater than what God has given already. He loved us and did what? He loved us and saved us. He loved us and sanctified us. He loved us and redeemed us. He loved us and he paid for our healing. He loved us and is preparing a place for us in heaven. We love him because he first loved us. How did he first love us? Let's look at Romans chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 8. It says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, First of all, he saved us because he loved us. And because he manifested his love in saving us and forgiving us and redeeming us and taking that problem of sin and the pollution of sin away from our lives. That's how we love him. And there's no alternative, there is no other thing to do just to love the Lord because he loved us and saved us. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. See the salvation that came to us. Now the condemnation is gone. Now the penalty of sin is gone. Now the eternal judgment is gone. And because of that, because of that salvation that he showed us, he gave us in his love. He said, we love him now because he loved us. You know when Jesus died for us, he didn't only spill or shed part of his blood. He shed all his blood. When he threw the spear at his side, all the water remaining there came out and all the blood remaining there came He gave it all. And because he gave everything his God, that's why he's saying, if you're going to reciprocate, if you're going to pay back, if you're going to show gratitude for what I've done for you, I gave it up for you all my life, everything I've got. And the only way you can respond to that is to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He loved us and he saved us. He loved us and sanctified us. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. And he said, we love him because he first loved us. He manifested that love in our salvation. He manifested that love in our sanctification. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, not the world now, that's for salvation, the sanctification. He loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The Lord Jesus loved us so much. He loved us so much to save us. He loved us so much to sanctify us, to purify us, to make us holy, and to make sure that all wrinkle, all spots, all stain, all of the results of the Adamic nature, everything is swept away and to make us so holy, transparently holy and perfectly holy and to be righteous and holy enough to take us to heaven. He said, if he has sacrificed himself and given so much in his love, what shouldn't we do now? We should reciprocate and we should respond in love because he First, loved us. Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. Who gave himself for us. 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works he says see what he has done he gave himself for us not just to save us but also to sanctify us not just to pardon us also to purify us and it's not just to make god forget our sins of the past it's to make us so holy and so righteous that god looks at us and he takes pleasure in us and he says because of that love that he first loved us and manifested that we ought to love him i pray you will love god and you love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And you love him above everything and everyone else here on earth. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading there from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10. Reading from verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Why, Lord? Oh, because he did for you what your father cannot do for you. Your father couldn't have forgiven your sin. Your father couldn't have saved you. Your father couldn't have sanctified you. Your father couldn't have gone to prepare a place for you in heaven. Your father couldn't have given you the better things of the future that the Lord is preparing for you. Come back to the children of Israel. All those children of Israel, they had fathers and mothers. But their fathers and mothers could not deliver them out of the land of Egypt, but God did. All their fathers and mothers could not open the Red Sea for them to pass through, but God did. Their fathers and their mothers could not give them manna from heaven for those 40 years, but God did. Their fathers and mothers could not have turned the curse of Balaam upside down and to make them a blessing for them, but God did. And the fathers and mothers could not have conquered all those walls of Jericho and make them to possess the land of Canaan. But God did. The fathers and mothers could not have stopped the sun when, when Joshua prayed. But God did. And he said, because I have done something for you that your father, your mother could not have done. He says, because of that, if you love your mother, your father more than me, you are not worthy of me. You are not evaluating my, my sacrifice very well. The sacrifice of love. Because I've done for you what father, mother, men, women, any way the world could not have done for you. Come back to that verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Why do you say that, Lord? Because I took my own, I took the cross, not for me. I took the cross up for you. And it was a heavy cross. Have you not read it in the Gospels? If 